Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. And then I'm going to shoot over to John chapter 19. We'll read verses 41 and 42. For those of you that are in the overflow, I declare that holy ground. And I know that you may not be in the sanctuary, but the same God that is in here is also over there. So I pray that you will lean in because I believe that God is going to use this message to touch hearts. And we're glad for those that are watching online. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Now the Lord God had planted a garden. I want you to shout out garden. He planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life. I want you to shout out and. There, there's another tree. And this tree is called the knowledge of good and evil. I want you to shoot over to John chapter 19 verses 41 and 42. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. Shout out garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I want you to repeat after me. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and the light for my path I will seek you with all my strength I choose to live my life according to your word your word O Lord is eternal you may be seated I'm going to close off our sermon series on the redemption story for those who are fairly new or new here for the first time, every month we like to start a collection of different topics. And on the top of the month, we have a theme. And the theme for this month is the redemption story. Now, if you've missed any of the Sunday sermons, you don't have to worry because I'm going to be able to share a word that is going to bring it all together. The Bible teaches us that there was a garden. There were two separate gardens. The title that I selected for today's sermon is from garden to garden. From garden to garden. When Jesus created earth, he created a garden that was called Eden. And before Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, there was no evidence of life. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 that God planted and since there was no rain yet, God created a mist to water what was planted. By the time Adam was created, he was placed in the garden. And the Bible says that God breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living creature. Now the garden is a designated place where its design and purpose is to produce. A garden is a designated area where flowers and shrubs, vegetables, fruits, and herbs are cultivated in a plot of ground. Now, without nourishment and care, life in a garden will be threatened by death. Without sun and without water, without God sending the mist before he even sent the first raindrop, there would never be product of life. Think about all that you and I gain with gardens. Food for both human and animals. Trees for clean air and shelter. Plants that provide spices, medicine, and more. Now, I really enjoy nature because it is good for my soul. I don't know how many of you enjoy nature. Going to the forest preserve, being able to see the trees that are lined up and the greenery, it gives life. My wife and I have taken walks through the forest preserve and 
while we're working out physically, we are also taking in the life source of the garden. For the past three years, there's a group of us here at the church. We would gather together, and we would go to the preserve, the forest preserve, and we would bike ride. And there's something about just cruising through nature and cruising through the garden that, that, that is refreshing to my soul. What the garden produces cannot be underestimated because in its nature, the garden's purpose is to give. And I know every day we walk outside and we don't necessarily take moments and time to reflect the beauty of God's creation. The life-giving that nature has given to us. Now out of all the places that God could have chosen to create Adam and Eve and place them in, he chooses a garden. Now, the interesting fact about the garden is that God clearly gives Adam a command. And here's what he tells him. I want you to work the garden and I want you to keep it. In other words, I want you to care for it. I want you to work it and care for it. Adam, I've given you everything that you need. All I need you to do is grab the resources I've given you so that you can produce more fruit. I'm here to tell you today that God has given you everything that you need. Many of us are overlooking what we have in our own hands because we're looking at what we got half empty. And yet God is saying, do you see that staff that you have in your hand? I can use that to split the Red Sea. You know that staff that you have in your hand? I can use it for you to strike a rock and water can come out of it. If you understand that if you just recognize that God has given you what you need, then you can give it right back to God and he would provide for you. This is, this is what's happening in the garden. Everything is already there. Everything is already set up for them. God always prepares us to succeed, not to fail. If you don't work the garden, then you won't reap the benefits of the garden. Because gardens, they need to be cared for. Gardens need to be taken care of. If you want to see more fruit, then you're going to have to prune. You're going to have to remove dead branches, pull weeds, and cultivate the ground. If there's things in your life that you don't like, then you're going to have to make some decisions to make the changes that you want. Some of these changes are difficult, but it will be worth it. Some of these changes are not easy, but you're looking at the end result of the decisions that you're making today. Don't keep around stuff in your life that you don't want in your future. If it's going to compromise your future, if it's going to compromise your joy, if it's going to compromise your peace, then you ought to work the ground today to get rid of what is making you compromise when God is saying more fruit is coming your way. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell them you got to work the ground. You got to turn the soil. You can't be lazy people. <laughs> I believe that there is a spiritual significance to this all. That the garden was meant for us. It is in our benefit that gardens have life. It is in our best interest that gardens produce. God did not create us to be lazy. But to be responsible beings. I'm going to say that one more time for the people in the back. God did not create us to be lazy but to be responsible beings. God did not create us to be irresponsible. Do you hear me in the overflow? He didn't create you and I to be irresponsible by neglecting our responsibilities. Neglecting our soul. Neglecting our faith. Like a garden, we have to take care of ourselves. You know, some of our neglect is not based on our laziness, but the lack of focus and intentionality of oneself. We can be serving in ministry, serving our spouse, serving our children, our friends, community, and yet dying inside because we've neglected ourselves. Working multiple jobs, but we're neglecting ourselves 
being in, in people's lives at the, at the sound of a call, but yet we're neglecting ourselves. Preparing to serve others. Preparing to serve the homeless in our community. Preparing to serve the hurting. And we give and we give, but yet we neglect ourselves. To neglect one thing is to pick something else up. If, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to run into fumes. If you are not mindful of where you're at, if you're not mindful of where your mental health is at, where your emotional health is at, you're going to run into fumes. And I'm here to tell you that if you want to be the best version of yourself, the best version of yourself to your family, to your community, to your job, to your purpose, then you've got to be renewed. You have got to be refreshed. You have got to be restored. I can only be my best for you when I am intimate with the Lord. I can only be my best with you when my wife and I are in a healthy relationship. I can only be my best for you when my children and I are locked in together. I got to take care of my home, but I got to take care of myself. So when I neglect myself, I'm picking up these other things. But what's happening is that internally we're being defected and hurt. If you neglect your soul, you, you won't find what, you're, what you really need. And you would pick up what eventually can kill you. You have a work mentality. You have a work mentality. You have a do mentality. But Jesus on the seventh day, he told us how to rest. How to be able to sit back and see the things that we've cared for. To be able to appreciate how far God has taken us. For some of us, there's been many victories in our life, but we don't even pause to reflect the small victories that we have encountered. We are waiting for the big explosion in our life. We're waiting for the big payday. But aren't you grateful of the simple fact that you still have a job? Aren't you grateful that you still got breath? Aren't you grateful that you're not where you used to be? Celebrate the small victories. Aren't you grateful that you were barren one day and in the next day you are now pregnant with child? Aren't you grateful? Celebrate the small victories. Because small victories will continue to accumulate. And you can use that as a weapon to remind yourself, God has been good to me. And you can remind Satan when he tries to remind you otherwise how good God has been to you. Don't neglect your soul. Marriages die because of neglect. Friendships grow apart because of neglect. Look at what it says in Matthew 16, 26. What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What well, Judas learned the hard way, that a few coins is not worth the betrayal of the Savior. It's just not worth it. That job, listen to me, is not worth it. That relationship where it's unequally yoked, it is not worth it. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? That payday is just not worth it. Because what you're going to find is that when you get there, you're going to want more of it. You will never be satisfied. You will never feel as if you have reached the pit of your life. What I'm trying to encourage you is that there's something that is missing and that is called your soul. Don't compromise your soul. Don't forfeit your soul. Don't compromise your relationship with Jesus. The garden is meant for you to care for. And spiritually speaking, if you want to receive the blessing of what is planted, you have to cultivate the ground. How, Pastor D? Through prayer. Amen. Have you neglected prayer? Through community. Have you rejected or neglected community? Have you become too busy to come together? Have, have you become too busy to spend some time and you have neglected God's word? Do not neglect his word. Do not neglect prayer. Do not neglect in coming together. It was in the garden that Adam and Eve neglected the commands of God. 
And because of that, they picked up their shame. They picked up guilt. They, they, they picked up fear. When you neglect one thing, you're going to end up picking something else up. When you neglect God, can I just tell you, the outcome of what you're going to pick up is anything that is opposite of. And many of us, we sit back and we're wondering, why am I in the place that I'm in? Because you've neglected God. You've neglected Him. You have, you have pushed God away from your life for whatever reason. You've neglected Him. And the worst thing that you and I can ever do is push God away from us. When you and I neglect God, we are falling into the trap and a despise of the enemy himself, who is the father of lies. Neglect. The Bible teaches us that God placed two trees in the garden. The first tree was the tree of life. That was the tree in which God says, I want you to eat from this tree. I want you to be restored when you eat from it. This is the place that would give you an abundance. But there is another tree. And this tree is called good and evil. See, instead of avoiding or eliminating any threats in the garden, they entertained it. They meaning Adam and Eve. See, in the garden, as I reflected in reading scripture, I said, God, why did you put a tree that would benefit Adam and Eve and another tree? That would harm them. And the Lord spoke to me and said, David, because when it comes to love, love is a choice. And when God created humanity, the Bible says that he created us in his image. And he created us so that we can be in relationship with him. So in order for there to be a relationship, then there needs to be two people that choose each other. And God says, I choose you. But here is two trees. Do you choose me? You can choose me by eating from the tree of life, which is obedience. Or you can reject me from eating from the tree of good and evil. And if you choose evil, then you have made your choice. Because of neglect. The Bible says that Adam and Eve, they fell into sin, disobeying God. Sin is disobedience to God. This is where the redemption story begins. The Bible says that God kicks out Adam and Eve from the garden, but God is again doing the work. God loves man so much that in his rich mercy, he transplants Adam and Eve to the world. Why would God remove them? From the Garden of Eden. Let me tell you why. Because anytime God takes you from one place and transplants you to another, He doesn't want you to go back to the sin that you have committed. When God transplants you, the Bible says that He put a cherub, an angel to guard the entrance. God don't want you to go back. God wants you to move forward. And you got to hear me here today, new life. That as God placed them into a new realm, what that means is that there is a new covenant. And now we know that in the new covenant that there is grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to stay where you are because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And when you accept them, the old has gone. The Garden of Eden. And the new has Come to God, place the angel to guard the entrance, avoiding them to enter. What God was doing is protecting Adam, protecting Eve for what? For his redemption plan. Some of y'all are frustrated because God has transplanted you, but little do you know that God has transplanted you from a place of sin into a new place, a realm where God is saying, here is where the redemption story will begin in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says this, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become 
the righteousness of God. It is in Christ Jesus that we can become the righteousness of him. It was for Adam and Eve's benefit that God removed them from Eden. God is the arbitrator of what is right and what is wrong. And when man chose disobedience, Jesus came to restore our broken relationship with him. Man was responsible for bringing sin into this world. Jesus Christ was responsible for redeeming us in providing the way through his resurrection. bedtime story? Yeah, Mom. Tell us the story of the man, the woman, and the magical garden. You like that story? Okay. Lay down and cover up. It really was magical. The garden was the most beautiful place you can imagine. The man and woman who lived there walked with God. They talked with him, and he talked back. Were they friends? They were friends. Anything they wanted in the whole garden was theirs. They were so very happy. They even got to name the animals. But the most beautiful part of the garden were the trees. The trees surrounded the entire garden.
Jesus was a garden where they laid him in a tomb. You heard it right. The tomb was in a garden. A place that produces life. And in Luke chapter 24 when the women disciples went to the tomb with spices to see Jesus. They found the stone rolled away as they entered the tomb. But they didn't find Jesus. Was he lost? Did they take him? Flabbergasted, confused. They wondered what happened to Jesus. And scripture reads while they were wondering about this. Suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed the lighting stood beside him. In their fright the woman bowed down with the faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead he is not here he is risen I have come to tell people here today that Jesus is not in the tomb so if you are looking in empty places trying to find life you won't find it there and I've come to ask you the very same question why do you look for the living among the dead did you come to church today to look at an empty tomb? Are you searching at places that you thought might have fulfilled you? You thought that relationship would fill you? You thought that alcohol would fill you? You thought that friendship would fill you? You thought, you thought, but it left you empty? Have you lost hope? Have you lost faith? Is it possible you're looking for God in all the wrong places? Why are you wasting your time in a tomb where there's dead people? Why are you placing a hope in a tomb that is empty? Our hope is not in an empty tomb. It's in the one who no longer is in the tomb. I want to tell you that Christ walked out of the tomb. And when Christ walked out, we walked out right with him. I thought I was going to get a better shout on that one. I said, when God walked out, then we walked out with him. And 
Can I tell you? You know what stayed in the tomb? Your depression stayed in the tomb. You know what stayed in the tomb? Your pain and your suffering and your agony. That stayed in the tomb. But when Jesus came out, the Bible says that morning is just for a night. But joy, I said, but joy. in the tomb in the tomb he was on Mount Calvary but when he died they placed him in the garden in the garden and before the garden where he was laid there was another garden that was called Gethsemane that was the garden where the Bible said that he prayed and God heard his prayer and he sent an angel to strengthen him. You have got to create a space, a garden where you cry out to God and he will give you the strength you need to endure the suffering. I have told you over and over that when you pray you don't start preparing to pray while you are ready in the battlefield you have got to get ready before the battle comes before you and you have got to go before God in prayer and tell him God I need your strength because I know what's ahead of me is going to be hard and I don't know what's ahead of you today and I don't know what you've been suffering or where you've been suffering but all I do know is that you are one cry away from God blessing you all I know is that it is possible you have been praying in an empty tomb when God is saying I need you to start praying in a garden where it's going to produce some life when Jesus walked out when he walked out of the tomb over 500 witnesses saw Jesus that was alive. No other religion would declare their God to be alive because they are all dead. But when it comes to Jesus, witnesses, historically witnesses declare, I saw him on that cross. I saw him be pierced on his side. I saw him breathe his last. I saw him dead. I saw him be taken down from the cross. I saw him being put inside of a tomb. I saw when they rolled a ton pound stone to guard the tomb. I saw when there were legions of an army blocking the tomb. And none of that held him down one day they thought that he was dead two days they thought that he was dead but here comes the resurrection here comes the third day here comes life and life in abundance he was on the third day because on that cross the bible says that he gave up his spirit what does that mean he went to heaven his soul went to Haiti and he grabbed the keys of death. And on the third day, his spirit reunited with his body. His soul reunited with his body. And he rose from the grave and he walked out. I said that he walked out of the grave. And when he walked out of the grave, not even death can hold him down. When I've come to tell you, I know that there's been weapons formed against you, but there is no weapons that shall prosper because we serve a God that is alive and he is well. I need you to lift up your hands all over this place. He is alive and he is well. 